Welcome to The Connecting Place with Andrea Fabry, making the connection between health and your environment. Now, here's your host, Andrea Fabry. Dr. Jack Thrasher is the leading toxicologist in the field, uh, in a lot of fields concerning toxicology, but particularly mold and mycotoxins and all that goes with water-damaged buildings. Dr. Thrasher was a huge help to our family in 2008 as we decided what to do with our home and our health. So, Dr. Thrasher, welcome to the program. What is goes on in a water damaged building it's more than mold what else is going on what else is going on is that there's being well overlooked is a variety of pathogenic bacteria now the bacteria require 95 percent water content whereas let's say stachyboxes requires only 90 percent so if you have a high water content, you will get bacteria, okay? And the bacteria are found in very high concentrations. For example, I did a case here in, in Sacramento, and we took dust from the bedspread from the master bedroom, and we found over 6 million uh, bacteria per gram of dust taken from the bedspread. Those people are very ill. They have ME, they have chronic fatigue, they have myalgic encephalitis, and a variety of other health problems. Uh, one of the bacteria that we found, which is very interesting, is called Streptomyces. And Streptomyces produces a mycotox, a, a toxin that is even more toxic than the tocophyces. And that is Dan Lindomycin, D A N I N O M Y C I N. That particular toxin was originally attempted to use by the pharmaceutical industry as an antibiotic, but wound up being too toxic that would kill the experimental animals. So that's what I'm talking about is that then we have these. Other bacteria, such as mycobacterium, there are several species of that that occur, and they cause a disease called mycobacterium avium complex, which again is very similar to what we say is that we say is just the general health problems that also occur in people exposed to mold. So I, that's the best I can answer. The other bacteria we find are streptococcus. Staphylococcus, Cryptococcus, uh, and, a number, you know, and a number of other known pathogens to human beings. So those who contend that mold is harmless and every place has mold, what you're talking about is more than just penicillium, aspergillus, and some of these molds that get into an indoor environment and make us sick. Yeah, see, see these bacteria, you know, they're pathogenic. Let's assume that I get, I'm in a moldy home, for example, a water-damaged home, and I get, I get staphylococcus or streptococcus or one of these pathogenic bacteria. Because it's a bacteria and it's in my lungs, I can spread it to the rest of the family. You follow? Yes. Now, what about remediating a water-damaged building? There are a lot of uh, different viewpoints on this, and so many times we hear from a mold remediator that we just pour bleach on it, it's going to be fine. What should we know about remediating a water-damaged building? Well, stay away from bleach. Bleach is probably the Bleach is a horrible irritant of the lungs and the eyes and etc. You use bleach and you chlorinate the uh, mycotoxin, and now you've got a chlorinated mycotoxin, which may even be more toxic than what the regular mycotoxins are. Bleach is not the way to go. Absolutely horrible. What about the chance? Is it is it always possible to remediate a home? Can you talk a little bit about that? I find, I'm beginning to find out that I do not think it's possible to totally remediate a home. 
Okay, we are testing the HVAC systems, and we are also testing the dust uh, that accumulates in the compressor of refrigerators. Why are we doing that? That's a question. Well, the refrigerator operates 24-7 and gives us a history of the home from the time the refrigerator went in until we test it. You follow? Yes. We can also test the HVAC system. Same thing there, okay? From the time that they enter the home and turn it on, that's the history of the home. What we're finding in both systems, and we're using the early 36 program, we're finding all of the toxic molds that we see with just plain water damage looking at building materials, and we're also finding the mycotoxins in the ventilation system and in the uh, refrigerator coil dust. So what else can I say? That means that, uh, for example, I had a home down in Huntington Beach, and I have another one here in Sacramento, in which the individuals could not return to so-called remediated home. The people at Huntington Beach completely gutted the home almost down to the to the foundation, replaced all of the air conditioning ducts in the house because they were contaminated. And after they did all this multi multi remediation, they were able to live in the home once again. I have a home here in Sacramento that the people will go back in with so called remediation and they could not stay in the home. So we went over and we tested their HVAC system. Guess what? Stachybotrys, catomium, all the other dangerous spores and the microtoxins were in the HVAC system, in the ducts. They turned them on and they would get sick. So they could not get back in the home. I don't know what this family is going to do. I've had several other families the same way. They finally just moved out of the home and got away from them. Okay. What is the difference between mold spores and mycotoxins? The mold spores are, are basically the same type of spores that bacteria, some bacteria use. And what they do is uh, the mold spores are released into the air and they, they land upon something uh, with a proper water concentration and they begin growing a new colony. You follow? The molds produce mycotoxins. The mycotoxins are in the spores themselves, but the mycotoxins are what we call secondary metabolites. They are diff- they are theoretically or, or supposedly to protect the mold from encroachment by other organisms in, in their environment. So it's competitive in nature. It turns out that unfortunately the mycotoxins are very toxic to humans and animals. Okay, and that's the difference. If you understand what I'm saying on that, is one that spore is is there for reproduction of a new colony, whereas the mycotoxins are present in the spores and the hyphae, uh, 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 the hyphae of, of the mold to protect them against intrusion or competition from bacteria and other other fungi. You follow? Yes. So what what does this tell us about cross contamination? Because this is the other common, very common question. Of course, you know this. You've worked with hundreds of families. Can't I take my things with me if we have to leave the home? Why or why not? Is that a good idea? Okay. Well, you know, I think I told you I'm redoing my list of uh, references. Okay. What we now know is that. Uh, Vibrations and air currents in the home fractionate up the colonies of bacteria and fungi and produce a variety of fungal and bacterial uh, fragments. The key fragments that I'm very concerned about that we're all concerned about are what we call nanoparticulates. The nanoparticles, for example, a mold spore is one micron or larger. Uh, Aspergillus species, for example, is about one micron. Uh, the, the nanoparticles are way down 
a low one micron, and generally somewhere in the range of 0 0.03 to 0 0.3 microns. What's so dangerous about these is that they are over a thousand times greater concentration than any airborne spore count that you get. These nanoparticles then are capable of binding to any and all fabrics. Therefore, cross contamination with mycotoxin. Okay, also, cross contamination can also occur as a result of spores that the, these organisms produce. So there are two types that can occur. One is the spores attached to fabrics, and definitely the nanoparticles attached to fabrics. So every time that a person puts on clothing that has nanoparticles in it, they're being exposed to the antigens and the mycotoxins and everything that the mold has uh, produced in that environment. Now, does that make sense? Yes, but can, will they grow? Is cross-contamination, if you bring this into a new environment, will this multiply or you're just going to continue to aggravate your existing health condition? If they take, take uh, contaminated furnishings with them or clothing with them and they have water intrusion in the new home, yes, they can get growth. All right, explain also, Dr. Thrasher, about non-viable spores versus viable. In other words, the claim is, well, it's all dead now, and yet that's not necessarily, that doesn't mean the end of the problem, does it? Well, non-viable means that uh, they've trapped them, and they've looked at them, and they've caught them in their air trap, okay, and they try to culture them, and they don't grow, so they're non-viable. However, the non-viable contain all the toxins and all the antigens regardless, okay? The viable are living. In other words, they take the mold spores, they put them in culture, and they are viable. So therefore, those are the ones that most likely will cause to cause contamination. The non-viable will carry with them all the toxins and antigens, if you understand. Isn't there a possibility if the mold or the water damage is very specifically located in a small area, say in a kitchen or bathroom, that it can be fixed? I can be fixed, not necessarily so. Again, you got to remember, it's so-called, let's say it's isolated in the bathroom. Let's say it's in the wall cavity for example, and they're going to tear out the wall or replace that. The wall cavities in a home, and I ask everybody to do this, take off the faceplate of any electrical outlet you have in the home and take a look at it. It is not sealed. Therefore, anything that causes uh, pressure changes in the home will push things out of the wall cavity into the room. Once it gets into the room, then you turn on your HVAC system, and guess what you do? You contaminate the HVAC system. So what, to someone listening who is skeptical that this can do harm, maybe they aren't impacted health-wise, what are some of the health issues that you see from water damaged buildings? Well, they, they, are, excuse me, they are very variable. Usually, the most common ones are general symptoms of flu like condition, body aches, uh, nasal congestion, respiratory congestion, lung congestion, coughing, headaches, uh, sometimes muscle pain. But they can get very serious too. They can, some individuals can develop a condition called sarcoid doses. S A R C O I D O S I S. Sarcoid doses, we don't know exactly what is causing it, but they do develop sarcoid doses, and it is, it is a systemic illness that it can involve any and all organs of the body. 
Now, in the latest paper I just published, I talked about a family here in Sacramento that the entire family, all five of them, developed what we call ME slash CSF, myalgic uh, encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, and um, so uh, I got off my train of thought. But anyway, so, so what, what I did in that paper, I discussed the possible role of the fact that these people also develop sarcoid doses. So the, the clinical symptoms of sarcoid doses are s severe skin rashes, enlarged lymph nodes, particularly in the cervical and axillary and groin area, uh, as well as neurological symptoms. Uh, and I'm putting this in my uh, latest update uh, and discussing this in more detail in, in my latest update that I'm doing. So uh, then the other thing that uh, I'm working with Dr. Irene Grant in uh, New York City, and what she has seen, and we're, we're putting together a paper on this, is that some individuals have colonization. In other words, they, they have mold, mold has colonized the body, particularly the sinuses and maybe other organs of the body, and if these people are not properly treated with antifungals, they continue to be chronically ill. Uh, so, you know, that's a very difficult question to give a simple answer to, okay? But uh, this is a very serious public health problem that's being ignored by the CDC, for example. You said to me that there are too many people suffering for you to retire. Is that right? <laughs> that is correct. You know, I, I'm involved with, uh, you know, Dr. Gray uh, down in Benson, Arizona, and Dr. Uh, Grant in New York, uh, Dr. Alan Vanitsky. You know, you name the doctors around the country, I'm involved with them. They are so busy with their clients, I can't retire because they have too many questions to, have to be answered. Do you follow? I agree with that. I'll be 80 years old coming up in August in the... Uh, I would like to retire someday, but I'm not going to retire until this issue is brought forth to the public. The public fully understands what is going on. I may die before then, you know, because like, you know, two years ago I had to have a quadruple bypass surgery, so who knows. Well, I'm glad that you are here, and thank you for all you do to help so many people, Dr. Thrasher. Thank you for being here. You've been listening to The Connecting Place, making the connection between health and your environment. Join us again next time for The Connecting Place with Andrea Faber.